Welcome everybody to Go Local Live. I'm Josh Fenton, CEO and co-founder. It is a busy Wednesday, lots of news around the country. If you haven't heard, the US Congress has agreed on a $2 trillion, not a word we often speak, $2 trillion uh, stimulus package that may give some short-term relief to the state of Rhode Island, especially for those who are unemployed. Uh, speaking of unemployed, the new numbers came out at about 10.15 this morning from the Rhode Island Department of Labor and Training. Uh, those numbers again today are sobering and they will probably continue to be sobering for some time. Those who have uh, filed for unemployment or temp temporary disability insurance over the past two weeks and one day is now above 62,000 uh, Rhode Islanders. Um, and lastly, we have a story up. Uh, sadly, a Rhode Island restaurant favorite, Bravo, up in the uh, theater district right across from Trinity Rep, has announced as a result of uh, the slowdown and shutdown, they are not only closing, but they will not reopen. So uh, tough business news this morning, tough labor news, and uh, uh, we'll get right to it in one second with Dr. Fine. Last update, Governor Raimondo will be on at 2.30 today, live streaming. Uh, you can catch that on Go Local. Uh, Dr. Fine, how are you this morning? I'm good. Nice to talk to you. Thanks, as always. Uh, let's go to the numbers. Uh, obviously, New York City is the, quote, hot spot of the United States. Uh, what do the numbers tell us this morning? Well, the numbers also continue to be daunting. I always like to start with the number of people who have recovered around the world. That's 112,000. Um, and remember, the, the numbers of cases, I'm not sure the numbers of cases really have much meaning because the number of cases uh, reflect testing as much as they reflect actual disease, understanding that the number of people with this disease is likely far greater than the number of people who have been tested. Uh, but around the world, we see uh, reports of about 440,000 people with the disease. That's an increase of 44,000 um, and a pretty robust increase. In the United States, we see 55,000 people uh, with an increase of about 8,700 or 8,800 people. Um, not as large of an increase as yesterday, but again, that's often an art artifact of testing, not so much disease. The numbers that are more sobering are the numbers of people who have died from this disease around the world and around the country. That's 19,753 around the world with an increase of about 2,500 people, uh, 2,500 deaths in one day. And in the United States, we now have very unfortunately 785 deaths with an increase of 187 deaths over a day. So the numbers are still going up. We have not, we are, I don't think we're even close to the crescendo, to the high point. In Rhode Island, uh, reported yesterday at one in the afternoon, we had 124 total cases, uh, 80, 18 new cases. I'm expecting that, that no, the number of new cases may drop a little bit today, reflecting the pace of testing earlier in the week. And again, you know, as, as far as we can tell at the moment, Rhode Island is doing great, um, but this is the number of, of tests more than anything else. What we hear is that there are only a few people in the hospital, and to me it's the number of people in the hospital or the number of people in intensive care units. Those are the numbers that we have to keep our eyes most closely on. Um, we wrote about it this morning. You flagged it today as well. The number of tests being uh, executed in Rhode Island seems to really be lagging. Nowhere near the number that the governor had promised by now. She had promised we'd be at about 100 last week and getting into over 200 this week. Um, Rhode Island, in comparison to Massachusetts, even when you modify for the population difference on a per capita basis, the number is dropping far behind Massachusetts. Is it, we, have we given up on testing? Have we just decided we're going to attack different aspects of it? But we don't really seem to be close. Well, I can't speak for the folks in state government. It looks like there's a relatively stable and constant number of tests done and run by the Department of Health each day. 
I know the governor has said that she's shooting for six to 800 tests a day. As you said, we're not close to that at the moment, but I'm hearing that there are remote testing sites that look like they're getting ready to open uh, around, a couple of places around the state. I don't expect those to be really up and running full bore till next week. Um, and even that, I'm not convinced that we're going to see hundreds of extra tests next week. I think we may see in the neighborhood of uh, an extra 50 to 100. I don't know how those are going to be reported, though. Um, the Department of Health reports tests done at the Department of Health. I believe the, report, the Department of Health will report positives that were tested elsewhere, but I don't know if the Department of Health will be reporting the total number of tests done at commercial labs and the Department of Health lab altogether. Again, you know, it's really the number of people who are in the hospital, the number of people who are in the ICU, what our capacity is for those folks. Um, and, you know, thankfully we haven't had any deaths in Rhode Island, but should and if those come, obviously paying attention to those numbers, that gives us an indication about how much disease is really out there. Um, our healthcare structure in Rhode Island, it's been well reported, uh, is fragile at best. Lifespan had a difficult fiscal year last year. Last quarter, Care New England had a difficult quarter uh, and has historically been uh, treading water financially. Um, what I'm hearing from the hospital industry is this is a little bit of as they get ready for what they expect to be an onslaught. Uh, financially, it's putting a tremendous drag on them because they've canceled every other. Hospitals will lose millions of dollars in March because of those elective surgeries being uh, canceled. And the cases, I think, what is there, four people in beds tied to the coronavirus. Will this federal stimulus help solve that problem? Or are we going to be facing, after we get through the coronavirus, a financial health care meltdown? Well, I think, you know, it depends on the numbers and how the stimulus actually translates to hospitals, to primary care offices, to community health centers. Really, everybody's struggling. You know, as, as community health centers and, and private primary care practices converted to try to do this telephonically um, and reduce the number of people who are walking through their doors to prevent transmission inside waiting rooms, their numbers have dropped off 60 and 70 percent. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to wait and see how this stimulus is distributed and hopefully make sure that it gets distributed to the parts of the healthcare delivery system that we need to strengthen most. Our traditional approach is to send all the money to the hospitals. I'm not sure that creates the healthcare system we need going forward. But certainly we want the hospitals to survive this, as do we, we need community health centers and, and primary care practices. So we develop the primary care delivery system that we, we really need. Uh, yesterday, Block Island announced that anyone who is not a year-round resident coming onto the island needs to self-quarantine for 14 days. Later in the day, the White House announced because of the number of people leaving New York, the metropolitan five boroughs area, leaving for their houses in Narragansett, Newport, Little Compton, etc., up and down the eastern seaboard to escape the city, that they should be in self-quarantine for 14 days. Did we, you know, you hate to say it, but did we make a mistake in letting affluent New Yorkers uh, out of the city? Oh, you know, I, I think, I'm not sure it really matters that much as long as they self-quarantine. Um, you know, you know the, the challenge is the is is that people need to quarantine and and you know the thing that I'm trying to remember and remind everybody is that we're all getting this. This isn't going away. It's not like we're going to be able to avoid this disease across the population. So this is more a matter of timing and when it happens. And like I like I said, if people will self quarantine in their own houses. Um, you know, some of those houses, I, I, this is maybe some bias, but I suspect some of those houses are big enough that they can be by themselves and not interact with other people. You know, that's perfectly fine, uh, you know, until 14 days go by and they've either gotten sick and recovered or didn't get sick. They may starve to death without the help serving them, though, in some of those homes. 
It's just saying. But, uh -huh. but hopefully they won't starve to death. Usually they've got some other way of getting things done. Um, let's go back to testing for one second. Does it matter? Does it really matter anymore? Well, you know, it doesn't matter that much yet. The place testing matters um, is when we get to the place that we have consensus around and have put up isolation hospitals. The battle with them, again, is we test, we identify people who are positive, and we get those people into isolation. Short of that, uh, I don't think testing matters much. What I'm hoping is that testing is the first step toward isolation hospitals. Um, and that will, those isolation hospitals will help us control the pace of the disease, remembering again that we're all getting this. And, you know, it's not whether you, we, we're not, we're not going to prevent, this is not a, a, a way to prevent disease. It's a way to prevent all the disease from happening all at once. Uh, so testing matters only if we are in fact building isolation hospitals. Um, and both of those matter most because they give us time to make sure we have enough ICUs. Uh, but remember, the number of people who get sick, the number of people who need the hospital, the number of people who need intensive care units, that's effectively preordained. The challenge is to see if we can spread those numbers so that they don't happen all at once. Um, the governor has taken some greater restrictions, but uh, clearly she, unlike our neighboring states, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, um, have de facto ordered folks to stay at home, not to go to work unless they are essential. Uh, from your standpoint, what impact is that helping our cause or n exacerbating more social uh, contact? You know, I just don't know. Um, I'm actually hoping to uh, be part of a webinar this afternoon that looks at the science of social distancing. Um, you know, I, I think we need uh, to make our choices informed by the science um, and understand the extent to which different levels of social distancing and different levels of restriction actually impact the spread of the disease. And I'm guessing, you know, we don't have that much precise science at the moment. So it's, we're, we're doing more than a little flying by the seat of our pants. And this is one way where it's kind of a judgment call. I suspect that it's important for more densely populated places, but for places that are not densely populated, it may not be that important at all. Uh, last issue that I wanted to raise was this issue of uh, gender. Older men uh, seem to be dying at a, a fairly significantly higher rate than older women, those 70 plus. Uh, that is not in the public discourse as much as the data is now emerging. Uh, is that really got to get to step up, that that message needs to get out there, that uh, uh, older men, 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, need that extra set of care um, accordingly from a public health standpoint? You know, I, I don't know if we can change that. You know, that looks like, if that's, if that's true and the evidence suggests that it is, we don't understand why it's true. And again, because everybody's getting this disease, um, I don't know that there's anything you can do if you're, you know, male and 75 to, to change the outcome. It, with one exception, which is stop smoking. Everybody who's smoking should stop smoking today um, to help protect themselves. But outside of that, you know, we're not going to be able to help people who are 75 not get the disease, at least until we have a vaccine, which looks like it's a good year away. Uh, Dr. Fine, anything else you want to add? Um, not at the moment. This is a day by day, you know, sort of looking at these numbers. There's lots of data that I think I'd love to have um, to, to get a sense of, you know, how fast to go, how fast to close things down, how fast to open things up. Um, but I'm hoping that you and I can talk about that a little more tomorrow. Um, there are lots of different data elements that, that we really need to get our hands around. Um, and 
you know, the, it might be a good a, a, a good topic for us to spend some time with uh, at a subsequent conversation. Uh, Dr. Michael Fine, former director of the Rhode Island Department of Health, thank you as always for tuning in. A couple programming notes, the governor will be on at 2.30. Go Local has a busy afternoon talking to uh, leaders in hospitality and in the business community about what they're doing. Uh, stay tuned for pretty much nonstop uh, coverage and uh, everyone please be safe. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks, Josh.